Hello, I'm Maddie Hale and this is Mad World. Welcome to 2024, the year the world goes insane. Two billion people go to vote. The US puts itself on the brink of another civil war and we all watch it through our phones. That is until TikTok gets banned for good. This week, a Democrat political stunt backfires. Have Rip Curl become the new Budweiser? And are Gen Z too woke to serve in the military? I'll be joined throughout the show to make sense of all this by Talk TV presenter JJ Anisiobi and columnist and broadcaster Esther Krakou. Thanks for joining me, guys. Hey. hey. Over to Washington, D.C. to kick off. This week, House Republicans are trying to impeach Biden's Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas. They think that as the guy who's meant to be in charge of security at the U.S.-Mexico border, that he's failed on all fronts. The reality is the number of illegal crossings at the U.S. border is at a record high, with 2023 seeing over 3.2 million encounters plus an estimated 1.7 million getaways since Joe Biden was sworn in in January 2021. So is the Biden administration just not strict enough on it? Are the Democrats encouraging an open border? Well, Republicans would say yes, but Democrats deny this. In fact, the party continuously claim that Donald Trump's approach to illegal immigration is far too extreme. Here's a clip of House Democrat Robert Garcia slamming these alleged plans. I want to remind the public that Donald Trump and House Republicans also have their own ideas for the border. So let's review the majority's border ideas that they've actually presented. Here they are. Donald Trump actually has said that he wants to build alligator moats along the border. That's one of his incredible ideas. Another idea that Donald Trump has promoted is he actually wants to electrify the border fence and maybe even put some spikes on the border. That's another Donald Trump and MAGA majority border idea. Is this the best campaign ad that Trump could actually hope for? Well, Twitter seems to think so. And ahead of the presidential election, border is being seized upon by campaign groups. One group called Citizens for Sanity have found a creative way to illustrate the problem. Super Bowl 56 held 70,000 football fanatics. Super Bowl 57 saw 68,000 fans, while 65,000 people will pack Allegiant Stadium for Super Bowl 58. Combined, that's not even as many people that cross the border in just the last month. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start with you. <laughs> I'll start with you, JJ. Obviously, with the earlier grab of Robert Garcia, that was an attempt to basically condemn Trump's mm. harsh thoughts on the border, but it did backfire on Twitter. People were like, well, we actually do need something as severe as this, as mm -hmm. the numbers they read out. What did you think of that? Well, actually, uh, since 2012, there have been sightings of crocodiles in the river, the River Grande. This is, this oh, is really? like a new thing. Yeah. yeah, and actually, on the Mexican side of the river, they have signs up saying, Legatos, beware. Beware of oh. crocodiles. So they, they are, there are sightings, but no one has, so far, as far as we know, no one's been eaten mm, by any of these one, things. Yeah. Um, but the river's dangerous. The crossing is dangerous. The current is strong. Mm. It's not going to stop them. Even if they, if they put hippos there, you know, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> Escobar had a, few, had a few hippos lying around, right? If they put hippos in there, you'd have to see the hippos ripping people apart oh my for, it to, for it to scare these people from coming across. Yeah, but it's terrifying because if you actually look at the day to day footage of immigrants going across the River Grande, as you said, it is thousands and thousands a day. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic, but I generally cannot believe that this is this is the state of affairs. I, can't, I cannot mm -hmm. believe it. I mean, if you think about the logic of, like, you live in a house with a door, right? You have windows. We, we regulate who comes in and out of our space. But for a country mm -hmm. to not do that, and for somehow that that not to be seen as a dereliction of duty is actually really yeah. strange. Nothing is going to stop them from coming mm. across. Uh, yeah, not gators, not fucking dillos, it. not Listen. men with, with guns saying, hey, stop, freeze. Nothing's going to stop uh, them. I, I, you hate I, to agree with I, me, I, but no, I'm right. I'm sorry. I think I hate the fact that I'm saying Trump was right on the wall. You mm. need a physical barrier. Mm. If you say nothing's going to stop someone from breaking into your home, well, why do you have a door then? Yeah. Why do you have uh, yeah. security alarms? Why do we have the police? There are actually mechanisms to stop people who's from entering for, a country. Well, do you pay for your? Did you pay for the door in your house? Yeah, essentially. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So who do you think should pay for a wall? Well, the Trump, people who, who benefit from Trump, yeah, the taxpayer. The taxpayer. But Trump says he's going to make Mexico pay for the wall. That's what he said the whole time. Well, Mexico he was obviously. But the thing is, the man, the man is full of. Um, he wasn't obviously going to do that. I mean, he would have found, like, he would mm. it, it would basically have been on the taxpayer. I think what he meant by Mexico paying 
paying for the wall is they're going to get some sort of favorable trade deal. And so the kind of tax kickbacks that we get from it is what's going to fund the wall. But Mexico is not technically going to pay for Trump it. Trump gets a tough time. You know, mm. he, he will get called a racist for, for trying to protect yeah. his borders, for saying stuff mm. like, let's put some crocodiles over there, that'll stop him. Like, People, a, mo like a moat. Like a moat. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll get called a racist. He's had Biden in for nearly, you know, it'll be four well, years yeah. by the time that the election rolls around. He's, And this would have been Biden's, probably his biggest... I mean, if he doesn't, if he doesn't yeah. lose the election, just yeah. I mean, let's, I can't believe I'm saying this. Forget Afghanistan, as difficult as that is. Mm -hmm. uh, but if this doesn't cost Biden the election, then I don't, I don't know what. I will. agree. You know, I think this will be one of the biggest issues that happens in no, well, that goes on voter minds in November. Yeah. yeah. And I think that when you look at, I think that people were just so quick to judge what Trump was saying. But I think the reality is that even if you're not a MAGA fan, you're not even a Trump supporter, you're not a Republican supporter in any way. I yeah. think they're going to go to the polls and say. The border needs to be fixed. Yeah. Who's going to do it? Do you know how many benefits you have as an illegal immigrant in the US? You can mm. you can get a loan, you can open a bank account, you can go to university. You bas you're basically a citizen. You have so many rights as, really? an, as an illegal migrant in the US. Yeah. Don't get any so ideas. Why, they come, why are they coming here then? They don't get it's any harder. ideas. Yeah. Don't it's get any go ideas. to America instead. You're just going to see him on the Atlantic. <laughs> <with> the <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Harvard. Amazing. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I'm going to Harvard. <laughs> the Democrats, right, they're big, dirty secrets that they don't want to talk about is Obama. Mm. Oh, the first black president, yeah. black, he's mixed race, so we can talk about that another time. Yeah. However, I'm not going to comment. <laughs> okay. He was However, deporter in chief. Deporter in chief. He yeah. deported more mm. illegal immigrants than every other 20th century president combined. Oh, yeah. he, he got out more uh, Mexicans, Hispanic people from America than Donald Trump did. And yet, because the Trump's thing is, the I think, I think he got it. Because at the end of the day, if the Democrats are going to go on the line that we are the defenders of ethnic minorities, the people that are suffering the most from this kind of illegal migration oh, are ethnic minorities. Ethnic minorities. Yeah. They're the people whose, whose communities are being swamped, mm. whose public services are suffering. You know, if you if you if you live in Martha's Vineyard, you have all sorts of fortresses to protect you. <laughs> if you're like a poor black kid living in Compton and you have this wave of immigrants that are yeah. basically taking over the black side of town, and now you need to speak Spanish to even be able to apply for certain yeah. jobs in America. I mean, really, yeah. how can the Democrats run on that line? Legal. But even the journey to get, if you've, like, I've spoken to a few reporters that actually sit on the border or sit on the other side of the border in Mexico, they say the actual journey to get it's arduous. is just insane. Yeah. And they, they don't, they say they don't report on the deaths, mm -hmm. they don't report on the sexual assaults, mm. the women that have been giving uh, the giving gang birth, crime, the, the gang fentanyl crime, coming across the, the drug border. smuggling, the human yeah. smuggling. There is so much that goes on in this kind of process to get over to America mm -hmm. that it's like, oh, we're in the land of the free now. It's like, no, 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 this is a traumatic experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is it. If they are so, what, what they are leaving behind must be so much worse that so they're willing to put themselves through that. Mm. They all know how bad this journey is. They all know how difficult it's going to be when you're in America. And then to be in America and to look, be looking over your back the whole time thinking, mm. I could be getting deported at any yeah. moment. And oh, to, to wanna, especially to wanna those 1.7 million getaways that are literally yeah. in the country without anyone even knowing, knowing where well, they what are. What if they commit a crime? Like, you don't know, you don't know well, who you're looking for. 100%. I mean, this, this is the stuff, I, I hate to sound hyperbolic, this is the stuff that revolutions are made of. Because yeah. it's 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 like, if you if you atomize it and you take like, I, I don't know, 20, 20 of me are bursting into your house, you know, JJ's Ooh. gonna get a shotgun out. <laughs> you know, it's like, come, Nightmare. come, come. There's <laughs> gonna be crimes committed here. Exactly. I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that really breaks people. And I think mm. if you take it on a on a national level, you're really setting your, your country up for failure. I'm going to start this. I want to head over to my Australia, my hometown, obviously. <laughs> Iconic surf brand Rip Curl has come under fire lately for not only letting go of one of its most famous faces, but also using a transgender woman as a promotional contributor. Rip Curl featured trans surfer Sasha Lowison on its Instagram page last week, only a few months after cutting ties with one of the most world famous female surfers, Bethany Hamilton, over her views of transgender athletes competing in sport. This is the same champion surfer, Bethany Hamilton, who lost her arm in a shark attack in 2003 and had been riding with Rip Curl since 1999. Hamilton herself has slammed the decision on X, writing, male bodied athletes should not be competing in female sports, period. Now, as you can imagine, Rip Curl faced enormous backlash over this, especially in Australia, where hashtag boycott Rip Curl was trending. One tweet from outspoken swimmer Riley Gaines read, you mean to tell me Rip Curl dropped Bethany Hamilton for opposing men surfing in the women's league, then picked up a male surfer who surfs in the women's league as a women's ambassador? Crazy. This tweet featured a tombstone that read, Rest in peace, Rip Curl died today after deciding that a man makes a better woman with the dates September 1969 to January 25th, 2024. 
Guys, what did you think about this? Because this sparked a bit of a, a wave of backlash, especially in Australia, but it did come wave. here. A ah, wave. Uh, but I'm very good, There we go. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it's interesting watching these kind of hierarchies of oppression cannibalise each other. So I didn't think... Because the thing is, you would think that lady uh, who, who basically had her arm chewed off by, by a shark mm. would be at the, t like the top of the totem pole for, for I don't know, the, 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 the oppression Olympics. But then she's been beaten out by a man. So I mean, it's it's really it's really interesting. You you kind of see who's who's fighting it out. I mean, I think I don't think this will end the same way Budweiser did because mm. Budweiser's main like sort of customer base are men. Yeah. Right. With Rip Curl, unfortunately, they have a mix of both men and women. Um, but I do so, think. I mean, unfortunately. I mean, unfortunately, because you know why? Like pesky both, women. You know why? Because the people co-signing this nonsense are mainly women. Yeah. Right. The people that people are asking why are women more outraged by having biological men in women's sports is because of other women, deluded women that are happy to virtue signal and make themselves feel good, like they're doing something, mm -hmm. you know, progressing the world. Mm. Uh, so I, I don't think it will happen the same way. I do think they will see a hit in sort of mm. sales, but I don't think it will be as catastrophic. And I think yeah. because it's such a well-known brand in the surfing world, you know, you, it's, I don't think it's as easily replaceable as beer. I agree. And it's also not on the same spectrum of, of Budweiser. Bud Light yeah. is the, was the biggest beer in the United States, whereas this is a and in many surf brand working in Australia. Men. Yeah, a hundred percent. It yeah. went against everything that their target market yeah. actually care for. What do you reckon, JJ? Well, the CEO of Rip Curl is a woman, so this is this is women against women. against women. Yeah, and uh, this like if I if I said to you now, okay, I, I'm called JJ, but I identify as a woman. Yeah. You're going to be like, no, JJ. Yeah, a Japanese woman called Miyako. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, there you go. Like it, it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. But because this trans woman, and this trans woman, still, she still looks How like a man. How did you see her? Her bicep, like man. Yeah. she looked like she would knock she, you she's out. She's still built like a, like a dude. Yeah. She has I think a... that's probably going to be the most like, outrageous part when you're in this <laughs> yeah. surfing competition. You're like, and yeah. why can't win? What happens, one arm, what first happens, of all. Yes. The, what happens with the promo? Like, do they airbrush the bulge? Like, I, I don't know if I don't know I don't know if the if I the, mean she, she what in the up. hell she might she she made the post up but for all she, she physically she still has mm. the the body of a man the bits yeah. yeah she has the body of a man but the, I'm talking about the muscle and the strength and the stamina mm. she has an unfair advantage so for for a woman to stand up and say crazily men shouldn't compete in the women's yeah. the women's uh, arena yeah. Yeah. and then she, essentially she gets dropped and loses out because mm. of that 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 is literally I, a mad world I understand it is a mad world and I think that you know everyone's entitled to do what they want but. Surfing is one of those sports where in the last 10 to 15 years, it has been an effort for women yeah, to, to even get in. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm Australian with them. Like, I know that, it, like, the surfing community has gone above and beyond to try and make it such a female-dominated sport to get up there with the men. So mm -hmm. I think that if you have the... If Rip Curl, one of the most iconic surf brands in Australia, yeah. has chosen to... it was I wouldn't say it was replacing because we can't confirm that it was a replacing, but to kind of do that instead of someone who had been with the brand since 1999, there's an actual movie around yeah. Bethany Hamilton where she actually is getting signed by yeah. this company and then to switch gears and give paid, you know, promotion to, or we don't know if it's paid, but promotion yeah. to someone who I think is the only transgender Australian surfer. Yeah. And that, but Rip could have deleted it now, right? Yeah, they they've yeah. deleted yeah. it. Yeah, so but you know, the thing is, that... I feel like these are the kinds of things that, I don't want to say stoke the, the culture rules, but it's because it's rooted in arrogance. I don't have a problem that this clearly male-looking individual identifies as... I don't care what they identify as, mm -hmm. but it's the arrogance to try and force the world mm -hmm. to accept you on those terms. Yeah. If most trans people were like, look, we identify as, I don't know, a pizza, but we're not going to force ourselves to try and go into women's bathrooms or into women's sports and all of that, no, we would never be having these conversations because most people genuinely don't care. We have our own mm -hmm. problems. We have taxes to pay. Um, but it's, it's this <laughs> arrogance of, oh, you must feel like this, this man with all the bits and the corresponding apparatus uh, is a woman, mm. that, that's why people get angry. Yeah, especially for female athletes. Exactly. I yeah. understand it. You're at a disadvantage already. Yeah. You know, we've tried so hard to... Yeah. Especially, like, when, when the um, when the soccer World Cup, the female soccer World yeah. Cup, I was, like, the I felt like the proudest female because oh, I really? just felt... Yes, because... Did you watch, did you watch it? Yeah, I watched, like, I watched, like, two games, but it was in Sydney. I was there. I was in yeah, Sydney. It was, and, it was terrible, man. Yeah, that's not football. Was terrible. I mean, we'll you guys beat us. But it doesn't matter. I just... I was a stand. I'm like, people are going to watch 
female yeah. soccer players. Yeah, I mean, that the, is the tickets, amazing. The tickets were being given away for free. Oh, I mean, so. you weren't there. No, I kid you, you not. Were there. You were there. Electric crowd. I tried. Honestly, my brother kicked me out of the room because I just <laughs> fell over laughing. It was yeah. just women's football is terrible. terrible. It's so <laughs> bad. I saw it's Chelsea. So bad. I saw Chelsea two weeks ago, and I Chelsea women. Chelsea women. Chelsea women. They are as bad as the men. They're the men. Good. They're Chelsea women. They're good. Yeah, look, me as a as a nearly forty year old man, me and my mates. Wow, you don't look good. Thank you. <laughs> we, we can also beat the Chelsea women's football team. Yeah. Really? I'll make that pledge to you now. We're, if we're, if we're, you're we're watching we're Chelsea women play like, play us at football, like, I swear to God, I swear yeah. to God, okay. me and my mates would beat the Chelsea women's football team. Wow. Women's football <laughs> is not real football. It's like watching kids kicking a ball around. Rubbish. You've got to be kidding. They're actually really good. He's right. No, he's right. You know Are the they problem not? Is. I mean, I haven't grown up with football. Do you know I what it is? I can soccer, so I'm going to get absolutely yeah. cancelled for this. You can tell the difference from watching it because the infrastructure is not in place because they play on pitches the same size as men. Men's right, pitches. Okay. So when they kick the ball, they have less energy, but it's supposed to travel the same mm. distance as a man's foot. But man's like, you know, man's power when he kicks. So you, it's like watching it football in slow motion, and it's so <laughs> obviously worse. And this is the problem. At the end of the day, like, you know, I don't know if you've seen female rugby players, but they make an effort. <laughs> <laughs> but at least they're making effort. They make oh, effort. Yeah. Well, guys, we're getting we're getting somewhere over to Montecito, where Netflix have pledged to make more content with Harry and Meghan. There's just one problem: no one wants to work on the production. Bennett Levine is the latest in a line of Archwell employees to jump ship from the tanking production company. Levine joined Archwell Productions back in 2021. At the time, the author and troublemaking royal enthusiast. Omid Scobie said that Levine joining showed a hive of activity that continues to grow. The outlook isn't so rosy now. The Sussex's production company already had two high-profile departures last year. They lost their internal content head, Ben Browning, and their marketing director, Farah Taylor. A Netflix executive has said that there are a bunch of brand new Harry and Meghan projects in the works at the streaming giant, reportedly worth $100 million. The question is, is anyone going to be left to help them make it? What do you think, guys? I think, I think so. I think there will always be, like, less is Hollywood. People sell their souls for, for less, like for mm -hmm. a biscuit mm -hmm. burger. Um, so there will always be people that want to at least jump on the Harry and Meghan bandwagon just for the name recognition. Yeah. I mean, this guy, he didn't work there for that long, but, you know, he can go into any co company he, he, he likes because, like, oh, I worked on sort of the most successful, successful Netflix series in history, Harry and Meghan series, mm. um, whether you like it or not. So I think they're going to be fine. I mean, I, I don't I don't know what the staff turnover indicates about the company, mm. other than maybe the management is not so good, so Harry and Meghan don't really know what they're doing on a business level, or maybe it's just people in Hollywood that attach themselves to the Harry and Meghan brand be at the beginning and now have enough leverage to leave and find a better job that's somewhere great. that's producing more reputable stuff. I don't know. I've made the point that just because you're famous doesn't necessarily make you good at something. I think actually their Spotify deal being cancelled, the whole deal being cancelled because of one failed podcast, that's indicative of a bigger problem. Because mm -hmm. if you can't sell your own self, like your personality as your USP, I mean, what the content you produce, I s suspect will be less appealing because it's not like, you know, Megan is like Martin Scorsese. She's not like a renowned producer. You know, Harry doesn't have any experience in Hollywood and all of that. So I'm like, either you, they must spend a lot of money hiring excellent talent to produce that stuff or really, I don't think they really know what they're doing and it's kind of becoming well, very well, clear. Well, let, let me interject as the showbiz expert here. Let okay. me interject. <laughs> as um, his title would say. <laughs> <laughs> this Levine guy was a nobody before he started working for Harry yeah. and Meghan. Right. And yeah, he, he started was. in the company in a very junior role, mm -hmm. was promoted very quickly. Archwell, Archwell Productions itself is a very small company. They don't mm -hmm. have a lot of employees. When they worked yeah. on Netflix, they had they, they hire in freelancers, essentially. Yeah. You have a team of 100 people. Mm -hmm. Same for Spotify. She had brought in, like, I think something like 60 people to work across her, her well, things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you bring in a lot of people. And in terms of what is successful and what isn't successful, you mentioned Scorsese. Mm. He's the most successful director of his generation. Yeah. DiCaprio, the most successful, the most uh, talented actor of his yeah. generation. Yeah. Even with the two of them together to make um, The Wolf of Wall Street, mm -hmm. they couldn't it. get financing yeah. for it. Yeah. They went yeah. to every production company and people are like, no, nah, I'm not sure it's going to work. You've got DiCaprio and, and Scorsese, Scorsese yeah, and you still yeah, can't get yeah. funding. Exactly. The, the draw card. Exactly. So mm. they had to go to Malaysia to get funding for, for, to make that film. So. This whole is Megan bad because she loses stuff. This it's is not, just it's, it's not that simple. Yeah, yeah it's okay. not. It's not. But this is. The, I think the point that I'm making is, if people of that caliber couldn't make it, I mean, I do think it doesn't mean that talent doesn't matter. It means it's that's not even everything. So I'm like, if they don't even have necessarily the talent, the production talent. You, you can see they're going to have far more hurdles to get over. I mean, all they have really is the name recognition. Yeah. And again. It depends on how you can capitalize on that. People have gotten bored with the whole royal family thing. Yeah. So they can't keep harping on about that. The sheen has worn off. So you really have to produce good content. Content is king. Mm. How are they going to do that when they don't really have experience 
improving exactly. the Exactly. I mean, because what they do is capitalise on their personal lives well, yeah, and airing I mean, their family. I don't know what ideas they have, but I'm more concerned about the Harry front because this guy hasn't done a hard day's work of, like, <laughs> like work in his life. Three, Not to be offensive, three of the sh but Three of their shows that they've done, aside from the Netflix one, the three of the things that this Levine guy produced mm -hmm. had nothing to do with the royal family or their personal lives. It was one about leaders, one about strong women in the world. So they're, they're making con they are making content that has nothing to do with them. Good. The mm -hmm. fact that you have to say that, like how many people would even recognise the other three content they've produced other than... <laughs> <laughs> you know, royal family adjacent stuff. Seriously. Because people, because people, you, know, you want to be passionate about what you do, obviously. Yeah. If you're going to work there, especially in a production company, you're obviously trying to be passionate about the yeah. content that you're producing. It does beg the question, are these employees bored? Um, I think I think they went into it with an agenda. And I think it's any employee. If you go into a company, you're always thinking, what is my future? What can I, how can yeah. I capitalise best on this? I don't think it was personal to Harry and Meghan. I don't know their management or leadership styles. I don't want to speculate because I don't think that's fair. Um, but I think you know, everything is about to do with their CV and how they can best exploit having a name on their CV. I think they just wanted to say, I work for Harry and Meghan. Mm. I have my name attached to this successful Netflix series. It's time to move on. I don't know if it's specifically to do with Harry and Meghan and them being horrible managers. I think Harry and Meghan are going to be just fine. Our show productions will be just fine. They're going to keep on making content. Yeah. It's going to do OK. One in every five of their things will be like a massive yeah. big hit. Um, but, but that's all they need. That's all they need, exactly. They just, they just yeah, need exactly. a bit of income. They just need a bit of income to pay for the security. All, all, they, yeah. all they need, <laughs> yeah. are, they, just, they, just need, they just need good people to head it yeah. up. Really, like, this is the thing. I even we talk about talent. Look at the Obamas and their Netflix deal. The Obamas yeah. have no production, yeah. you know, yeah. to background at all. They just had really, really good people around them. So that's what Harry and Meghan need to do. But they also need to do it being cognizant of their brand. So mm. it can't be preachy or annoying. You know what they've got to do? They've got to hire the three of us. Oh, the seriously. The combination. Right. Yeah. We're gonna, guys, we're going to move on to something exciting now. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is a problem that we're seeing all over the West. No one wants to join the military. Dun, dun, dun. And that's tricky as the world is becoming even more unstable and the Ukraine war is bringing conflict close to NATO's doorstep. But it looks like it could be hard to get the next generation of troops to serve. A number of US military TikTokers have taken to the platform to urge other young people not to enlist. These are my top five reasons on why you shouldn't join the military. Reason number one is pay. We do not get paid enough for what we do. I'm not here to say that we get paid pennies. I'm just saying that we don't get paid enough to perform the mission that is tasked to us. Reason number two, family. You will not see your family often. You might see them on holidays and and that, that's about it. Addiction, bro. Caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, everything. You're gonna be addicted to it, everything. And one older social media user has posted to remind us what conscription used to look like. It's a contrasting situation. I know, yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think? Do you think they're too Gen Z too woke? Thank, thankfully, I'm a millennial. I, mean, I think Sorry. it's a, I think it's a values disconnect. I mean, in the US in particular, they're known for recruiting. I mean, mm. you can't have join the military if your IQ is below, I think, 70. That's the IQ of a carrot. So really, they target <laughs> um, less scholastically successful students, should I say. So for them to complain about pay, I'm like, your economic value is very low. You don't have the IQ of Einstein. Wow. Wow. But also, there's a values misalignment. You're going into the military to serve your country. Yeah. It's not about, like, that should be the biggest benefit. It's like going to the police. You're not going to the police in the hopes of becoming a millionaire. Mm -hmm. it's, it's because of the values that have drawn you to it. So I think that that's probably a big issue. Um, but also, in the US, for instance, one of the biggest issues they have with recruiting people in the military is they're too fast. They're too oh. overweight. They're like, serious. They're just, they're, they don't meet the fitness standards. In the UK, for instance, there's, well, fitness is not as big of an issue, but it's again, it's a values thing because people don't feel as attached or rooted What's in that their own country. What's that to do with Gen Z? Gen well, because they're the biggest, because the thing is, Gen Z don't really know anything. Yeah, but Gen Z, so they have Gen, to be Gen inculcated Z, Gen with Z, values. Gen Z are not saying we're not going to serve because we're overweight. Well, this, they can't, they this, can't this, serve. This question they is, don't want to serve. They don't want to serve. Yeah, Gen Z don't want to serve, but that's not because they're overweight. How are you going to hate from outside of the club when you can't even get in? They're too yeah, fat to serve. I've got to cross that out. <laughs> it's just taking this <laughs> to a new level. I'm just saying, I'm just just saying you can't it's say we mental. don't want to serve if you've Esther never qualified. Crackers. I know. I think the problem with Gen Z, and I don't think this... I mean, and I, the military. I, and the military. military. I do hate Gen Z, but I think I think I hate them. I can't stand them. They're lazy. They are snowflakes. However... They see the world for what it is now. It's mm. The army, the government cannot sell to us, these are bad guys, mm. these are good guys. This is, we see it on social media. So Gen Z now look at the world. Like we talk, we spoke, you spoke about NATO and yeah. Ukraine and Russia. The UK and the US would have us think that Putin's the bad dude. Putin is saying, do not put any weapons or military bases along these borders. 
the West are moving towards him. It's yeah. like him moving towards us, yeah. it's the other way around. So people now see this and we think, well, actually, I don't I think, agree with. with my I think government. that's a very yeah. generous yeah. assessment, though, because you're saying this because you're no, you're, because you're saying this because you're a pretty clued up man. I don't think Gen Z are Ooh, that clued thank up. You. No, but seriously, I, I, well, mean, I don't think if that you talk, come to a conclusion. Have you talked to a Gen Z about international affairs? I would dream painful. of it. They, <laughs> nothing. It's like a monkey clapping cymbals together. There's nothing there. I don't even think it's a. I genuinely think they're thinking, what am I fighting for? They don't feel attached to this country. I think no, that's no. that I, on the that on the most kind of baseline argument. Mm. They're thinking this like this country is a balkanized mess. In America, mm. you have all these millions of immigrants coming in over the course of a year. In the UK, I mean, you go to London, that's Londonstan. You, you go to other parts Lundestan. of the world. Yeah, oh. That's what I think is the whole point of this like influx of TikToks is that everyone's taking the piss out yeah. of conscription because they're just basically like, what? Yeah. We would never do that. Yeah. We would yeah. never serve. Yeah. We would never like put our bodies on the line for the country. There's no like patriotism like there probably was. I mean, you probably have a, a point. Like, they wouldn't want to go and fight in, like, let's say, Gaza or whatever. That that could be it if they're clued up. But I I, I don't have that much faith in them. I don't yeah, think no. that they read up... All, like, of, all, of our pre things. all of our press, a lot of our press, when we talk about um, uh, er er Gaza or... Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. the, the Iranian-backed Houthis or whatever. Yeah. We don't say the US-backed people. people. Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? no, so, it's very antagonistic. Exactly. So you, you, I mean, the, the, clearly there is, there is... I don't want to say agenda because that sounds conspiracy theorist, but clearly there is, there's an agenda here to, to, to at least nudge you towards one direction. This is the good bad, this is the good mm. people, yeah. these are the bad people. So and I, I think, get that. Yeah, and I think yeah. Gen Z now don't see the world as good and bad. They see no. a world that is so very generous. mixed in well, I can't believe you hate them. If not, I, do, I do hate Gen Z. Giving them this I much credit. Them. <laughs> Actually, final, your Gen Z. Final words is JJ hates Gen Z. And that is the headline. That's all from us on Mad this week thanks to JJ and Esther and thank you for watching and don't forget to like share and subscribe